Now, I was in downtown Los Angeles a little while ago, and I brought some food from a street vendor. And they said, you have an accent. Where are you from? I said, well, I'm originally from New Zealand. He said, well, where is that? <laughs> so to make it really simple for him, I said, look, it's way down in the South Pacific near Australia. He said, oh, right, where Arnold Schwarzenegger comes from. <laughs> So, so perhaps there needs to be some voting knowledge tests applied. But I'm going to talk today, well, first of all, I'll say, look, I was in New Zealand last year. My dad is 91 years old. And we were talking about World War II and how terrified he was as a little boy seeing the Japanese coming down through the Pacific. And if it hadn't been for the sacrifice of your uncles and fathers and grandfathers who stopped the Japanese at Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea and Midway, I probably wouldn't be here, folks. So everybody who cares about liberty has to be grateful to America. If we want to preserve liberty, there's nowhere to run. It has to be fought for here. You know, if, if there was somewhere to, you know, people say New Zealand's a really safe place. Look, if America goes down, the Chinese will have us in a heartbeat. We'll take a phone call. So, I want to talk tonight a little bit about how communism works, how it works in California, how it got its foothold in California, some of the people you know, and a little bit about the world scene, maybe, a little bit about the national scene but also why we do what we do. Why do we even bother doing what we do? You know, especially when you're behind enemy lines, as you guys are. So, first thing I'll say is this. How many people here ever had to undergo a background check or get through a security clearance procedure for a government or military position? Okay, third of the room. Yes. Is it true those background checks are very, very rigorous? Well, they used to be. They go through your family background. They look at your criminal convictions, financial irregularities. They might interview your youth pastor, your high school teacher, because they need to know you are a trustworthy person who will not betray the Constitution. But what if you're a young Marxist radical like Adam Schiff, or Jimmy Garcia, or Judy Chu, or Raul Ruiz, or Mark Tucano, or Mike Levin, or at Maxine Waters? You hang around with the local communists, the local unions, they get you elected to Congress where you may serve on the Homeland Security Committee, the Armed Services Committee, even the Intelligence Committee like Schiff, how much of a background check do you need for those positions, folks? Zero, nothing. You think maybe the Chinese know about this? And the Iranians, the Russians, the Cubans, North Koreans. But don't worry, because there's no way that radical Marxists or communists or you know, terrorists could ever get into the United States Congress because because we have an organization specifically designed to stop that sort of thing happening. And that is the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I, th I thought you'd all be relieved. I thought you'd go, hallelujah. You know, once you would have, once the FBI was an extremely patriotic and an extremely efficient organization. I had a friend in the FBI back in the 60s. In Northern California in the 60s, there were five leaders of the Communist Party USA. Three of them were FBI agents. They had it under control. Very much under control. Not, not now. But the FBI has another problem. Even if it was well led, even if its current leaders were not traitors, they are answerable to the Judiciary Committee the most powerful committee in the United States Congress. Now, does anybody remember a man called uh, John Conyers from Michigan? 
He was in Congress from 1965 to 2017. And for nearly 40 years, he was either the chairman or the ranking Democrat in the Judiciary Committee. He was the man who abolished your House Un-American Activities Committee um, back, in the night, back in 1975, one of your last lines of defense against internal attack. John Conyers was working for Moscow for most of his career. He was a card-carrying member of Democratic Socialists of America. That's Rashida Tlaib, Ocasio-Cortez, and all the rioters supporting Hamas all over the country right now. And he was a 50-year veteran with the Communist Party USA. But he oversaw the Justice Department and the FBI. Now, do you remember who took over from John Conyers chairing that Judiciary Committee? The Democrat who took over? No, no. You've seen him on TV. He takes up the whole screen and he tried to impeach your President Trump twice. It's Jerry Nadler from New York. Also a card-carrying member of Democratic Socialists of America, a Marxist. Two Marxists from the same little organization held that position consecutively. Now, that could be a coincidence, but it's more likely Lenin. V.I. Lenin said, it is not the gaining of power that's important, it is the keeping of power that's important. In other words, if they get a position, they make darn sure their successor will be put from the same radical group. And also on that committee was someone you all know and love on the Judiciary Committee, a woman called Judy Chu. I thought she was loved in this area. Well, by the communist Chinese she is. Look, Judy Chu had a 30-year history with the Communist Workers' Party. That's the most militant pro-Chinese Communist Party in the country. She still works with their ex-members today, right now. She, is, um, she has been to China multiple times. She has arranged... Uh, she has, look, every time the FBI arrests one of the more than 25,000 Chinese spies, currently in this country. That's too much. She is on their case. You're a bunch of racists, she says. You're only persecuting these people because you hate Asians. And she's arranged for sensitivity training for these cruel FBI agents so they don't go after these Chinese, poor Chinese spies any longer. Judy Chu is the Chinese Communist Party's representative in Southern California. She runs the San Gabriel Chinese community for the CCP. 100%, not one bit loyal to the United States. Not one fraction. Now here's an imaginary scenario. Don't get all excited about this because this is only imaginary. This is what should happen. One day the FBI wakes up. They think we are losing our country. We haven't been doing our job. We've got at least a hundred members of the House who couldn't pass a background check to drive a school bus in LA County or any other. They are the reason that our southern border is wide open. They are the reason our kids are being indoctrinated in schools. They are the reason Iran is about to get the nuclear bomb. They are the reason our own military is being gutted before our eyes. They are the reason that Hollywood can no longer make an anti-communist movie. Only woke stuff. They are the reason why our colleges are woke. Our sport is woke. They are ruining the country. They are revolutionaries. They want to destroy us. We better darn well do something while we still have a chance. Let's go to our bosses in the Judiciary Committee. Let's talk to Mrs. Chu and Mr. Nadler. Mrs. Chu, Mr. Nadler, we need to investigate at least a hundred of your Democratic colleagues for working for enemies of America. Do you mind? And by the way, Mrs. Chu, by the way, Mr. Nadler, 
You are number one and number two on the list. Is that okay? What do you think would happen to their budget if they pulled that one, folks? Or their pensions or their careers or even their lives? You think the FBI is stupid enough to bite the hand that feeds it? So this is the problem. There's no background checks in Congress at all or the White House. There is no media scrutiny if you're on the left. And the FBI and other security agencies don't dare to come after you. That is why we have all those problems, folks. That's why it's happening. But at least we've got a moderate Democrat in the White House. Well, that's what the New York Times, New York Post said. New York Times and the Washington Post. Joe Biden would be uniter. He is an old-fashioned Democrat who will bring us together. <laughs> well, if he was, then maybe. Look, if you read my book up there, White House Reds, Joe Biden has been working in the interests of the Russians since 1972, the Iranians since about 78, and the Chinese since 2001. He has always been working for the enemy. There's never been a time in his political career where he was working for America. He was the Soviet Union's biggest friend in Congress, along with Ted Kennedy and John Kerry, who I call Jane Fonda with less testosterone. <laughs> but check it out. But I want to talk about a, a couple of his cabinet secretaries. One of them you will know. But first of all, I'll talk about, does anybody, well, does anybody know who the current Secretary of the Interior is in this country? Nobody's ever heard of her. She's a complete non-entity. Name is Deb Harland. She was a second term Native American Congresswoman from New Mexico. Now she has oversight over 20% of America. Do you have any public land controlled by the Department of the Interior in California, folks? Yes. Have a look, but you're allowed to mine it and drill it and log it and ranch it and hunt it for the benefit of your people, right? Really? See, this is the thing. What was the very first thing that Biden did when he took office? Keystone Pipeline, right? 11,000 American jobs. First action. 11,000 American jobs just toast. Because Native Americans were protesting in the Dakotas. Well, those protests were organized by Judith LeBlanc of the Native Organizers Alliance and also the Central Committee of the Communist Party USA, which is 100% loyal to China. So Judith LeBlanc then went out and did big, native, big voter registration drives on Native American organization reservations in Montana, Nevada, Minnesota, New Mexico, Arizona, all states that were a little bit purple and the Native American vote would make a difference because it goes heavily Democrat and they don't normally vote in big numbers. And as a reward for that great work, she was allowed to nominate her very close friend and fellow Marxist, Deb Haaland, as US Secretary of the Interior. Now, nobody had ever heard of Deb Haaland, and this is a very important position, so Judith LeBlanc had to mount an actual political campaign to make her known. They had buses, Deb for Interior, badges, Facebook pages, Twitter hangouts, you know, fundraising events, all sorts of stuff, Deb for Interior. They had a whole bunch of celebrity endorsements. They had Alyssa Milano, Sarah Silverman, Hanoi Jane Fonda, Mark Raffalo, Cher, Gloria Steinem, Deb for Interior. And this is not a secret, it's still on Facebook. And they got her noticed by Biden, and Biden nominated her, and she was confirmed with four Republican Senate votes. And when I say Republican, you know what I mean. I'm talking Democrats in drag, 
like Mitt Romney, Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins, etc. They put her in that position. She is now slashing every single energy lease she possibly can. She's absolutely shutting down oil drilling at every opportunity all over Alaska, shutting down fracking, shutting down uranium mining in northern Colorado. When America is starved of energy, she is making it infinitely worse. Meanwhile, Biden has sold off 50% of America's strategic oil reserve, some of it to China, and that is reserve we're supposed to fight a war with. We now have enough to fight for 18 days. Can you imagine a war with China lasting 18 days? Deb Harland is a Marxist. She is put in place by an agent of China. Do you think the Chinese have an interest in wrecking our economy, perhaps? Yeah. And here's another one you'll all know and love. A woman called Julie Su, who was the one in charge in your state of handing out all the COVID money. She is now Acting Secretary of Labor. She can't even get confirmed, so Biden is leaving her illegally as Acting Secretary. She gave all the COVID money out in this state, massive corruption, but what do you do with a corrupt local California official? You make them a cabinet secretary. What else can you do? So now she is secretary of labor. The last year, we saw more strikes than the last 10. We saw almost a big strike with United, with um, UPS, would have cost billions. We saw a big strike uh, with uh, United Auto Workers Union. We saw a whole bunch. There's a big labor upsurge because she's Secretary of Labor. And now what you're going to have this year, they're getting ready for big strikes at Long Beach and the Inland Empire uh, warehouses. That is a massive supply hub to the entire country. You shut down Long Beach and you shut down those warehouses, which they're working on right now, you're going to see empty shelves all over America not very long. Because Julie Sue used to work with the League of Revolutionary Struggle when she was back at Stanford. That's a pro-Chinese Communist Party. Then she worked with Stuart Kuo and Kent Wong of this town, both former leaders of the Communist Workers' Party with Judy Chu. Um, Ken Wong run, runs, is a big labor guy, runs a big labor center at UCLA. Um, Stuart Kuo runs, runs Asian Americans Advancing Justice, which was one of the groups allegedly that was employing Black Lives Matter activists to stuff, stuff ballots all over the country in the last election. So Julie Sue is a Maoist. And then there's one more, Jennifer Granholm, Secretary of Energy, formerly the governor of Michigan, mentored by the famous Michigan Marxist Millie Jeffrey, the woman who got Geraldine Ferraro on the Democratic ticket back in 1988. Well, Jennifer Granholm is the one who's telling us that all US military vehicles are going to be electric by 2030. Okay? That's crazy, but can you imagine the money that's going to be wasted on that project? Yeah. Can you imagine the time, resources, billions and billions of dollars when China's building nine ships to our one, we're going to be making our tanks and APVs electric. Now you could say this is stupidity, or you could say it's sabotage. What is the most likely explanation here? You know, Biden's debacle in Afghanistan gave Bagram Air Base to China, gave um, all those rare earth minerals to China, which is going to make the electric batteries for our vehicles. What, what, you know, Biden's working for China. He gave that country to China, people. 
But don't worry about the electric vehicles because I'm sure that your government is going to negotiate an agreement with the Chinese that in the event of a shooting war, American troops are going to get time out on the battlefield to recharge the batteries in their tanks and APVs. Would only be fair, would it not? Now how does communism actually work? People look at communists, see some communists will stand for public office and they'll get 12 votes and everybody laughs, okay? There's probably about, I would say, 500,000 hardcore communists in the country. About 100,000 in Democratic Socialist America, 10,000 in Communist Party USA, a whole bunch of other little groups. Then you've got to count all the Marxist professors and Marxist clergymen and all those. Hardcore revolutionaries, probably about 500,000, which is not a lot considering the size of the country. But remember, Lenin took over Russia with 2,000. You know, Fidel Castro took over Cuba with 80. It's not the numbers, but this is how it works. Now, back in 1984 in New Zealand, we elected a socialist Labour government. And the very first thing they did was to ban nuclear warships from our harbours. It was all about peace. It was all about standing up against the nuclear arms race. And New Zealanders were very proud, but that destroyed our military alliance with the United States. And I campaigned against that. I thought it was the height of ingratitude, being saved by America and then saying, but you can't send your ships here. So in the course of that, I met a, a New Zealander, a Dutch New Zealander, who had infiltrated the New Zealand pro-Soviet Communist Party, the Socialist Unity Party, for our security services. He was a government spy inside the Communist Party. And they had 400 members in the country, 400 members in a country at the time of nearly 4 million people. So in October 1983, my friend, his name was John van der Ven, was sent to Moscow with three genuine communists to train at Lenin's Institute for Higher Learning, the Master Lenin School, otherwise known as the Institute for Social Sciences. Three and a half thousand people in this complex, right on Leningradsky Prospect near the Metro Port, big and old Tsarist mansion, and they were trained on racial agitation, they were trained on union work, Russian history, espionage, bomb making, you name it. Well, while he was there, they planned New, New Zealand's anti-nuclear legislation. Because what they were trying to do at the time, they wanted to invade Europe. But NATO was too strong, and Reagan and Thatcher were too strong. So they thought, because they were funding all these big ban the bomb marches all over Europe, and Greenham, Conham, Conham, Common, and you know, disband NATO, get the Yanks out, all this kind of stuff. But Reagan and Thatcher wouldn't budge. So they thought, we'll take New Zealand out of the anti-nuclear, out of the nuclear alliance, and that will encourage the European peace movement. They're very subtle. They play chess, people. You know, they can't get the king, I'll take a, a rook over here, I'll take a knight over here. It's all strategic. And so they knew New Zealand was very pro-American. So this couldn't be a campaign. You know, Yanks out, we hate America, disband ANZUS. It had to be New Zealanders standing up for an independent foreign policy. New Zealanders standing against the nuclear arms race. They had 16 experts at this institute on New Zealand alone. They had sociologists, historians, psychologists. They knew the sporting culture, the religious culture, the economic culture better than any New Zealander. They knew how to pull New Zealanders' strings, just like they know how to pull yours, because they study it all the time. And so they came up with these slogans. This little group of four communists went back to New Zealand held secret meetings with the labor unions which they controlled, 
the peace movement which they controlled, and the Labour Party that infiltrated. They signed a secret agreement with the New Zealand Labour Party to ban nuclear warships from our harbours at the Hotel Workers' Union rooms in Marion Street in Wellington and our capital. And in six months, the legislation was passed, warships were banned, and our military alliance with the United States was kaput. And not one New Zealander, probably 10 New Zealanders and 300, 3 million people had any idea how it happened, and still don't. So this is how communism works. You look at something like Obamacare, communist policy. Nuclear deal with Iran, communist policy. Open borders, communist policy. Um, fracking bans, communist policy. Downgrading the US military, communist policy. Teaching woke history in schools, communist policy. Uh, the radical transgender movement, communist policy. All of these are communist policies that have been implemented by the Democratic Party. So how does this happen? The communists come up with a plan. This is what we want for America. We want open borders. They make it union policy and the unions make it Democrat policy. There's not a Democrat in California who gets elected without union support. Can you imagine, have you ever heard of one? So if the unions are getting you elected and paying your bills and providing your manpower and then they tell you what policies they want implemented, what do you do? Exactly what you're damn well told. Now here's the proof of this. Can you remember back in the 1980s which group in America was the most militantly opposed to illegal immigration? Who had people on the border? Who was going out in the fields turning people into the INS back in the 80s? It was the unions people. Cesar Chavez had people turning in illegal immigrants to the INS. The unions hated illegals because illegals took their jobs, broke their strikes, and depressed their wages. Very logical from a union point of view. They didn't want illegals. And the Democrats had the same policy. You look at Harry Reid or Bill Clinton from the early 90s speaking about illegal immigration and the absolute national security disaster it was. 250,000 coming across the border of the, a year. We can't sustain this. This is a national disaster for American workers. A huge security risk. We have to stop this. 250,000. Oh, for that number today. But then this is what happens. Because in those days, the American unions were run by Lane Kirkland and George Meany, who were not communists. They were patriotic Americans. So they stood up for the worker. Might not have agreed with their tactics, but at least their heart was in the right place. In 1994, Democratic Socialists of America took over the AFL-CIO and put Lane, uh, John Sweeney in as president, a card-carrying Marxist. Then they removed the anti-communist clause from the AFL-CIO's constitution and the Marxists came flooding back, flooding into the unions. By 2000, Alisaia Medina, another Marxist, the executive vice president of SEIU, got the AFL-CIO at their conference in Los Angeles to flip their policy from opposition to illegal immigration to complete support for it. 100% reversal. And since that time, the policy has got broader and broader and broader, and the Democrats have gone further and further to the left. This is how it works. The communists took over the unions in 1995, and it's gone further left every single year since. And then Obama came in, and it went on steroids. The unions are the transmission belt of communism. 
Alice A. Medina, we have them on tape in one of my movies up there at a big progressive conference in Washington, D.C. in 2000. Uh, in, in, no, about 2008, he said. There are 11 million illegal immigrants in this country. Most of them Hispanic. We know that in the last election, Hispanics voted 70% for progressive candidates. If we can legalize these 11 million people, they will stand with us. They will give us 8 million more Democratic voters. That will give us governing control over America for the foreseeable future. People, Hillary Clinton was going to legalize every single illegal immigrant within 100 days of taking office. That would have given her 15, 16 million new Democratic voters. Now it's more like 30 million. Most presidential elections are won or lost by 5 million votes. How do we ever come back if we lose the next election and they legalize the illegals, people? This is how communism is implemented through the union movement. Now, I'll give you another example of this. The, the man who started the Illegal Immigration Unit was from LA, originally from San Antonio. It was a Communist Party member named Bert Corona. Very good friend of Ted Kennedy. No, Bobby Kennedy, the, the first one. And uh, they started up Latinos for, what was it, Latinos for, Democrats for Kennedy or something back in the 60s. The first organized attempt to get Latinos voting for the Democratic Party. But Bert Corona set up a whole bunch of organizations in Southern California dedicated to supporting illegal immigration. And he trained a whole bunch of people like Antonio Villagarosa, your mayor, who basically turned LA into a sanctuary city. Gil Cedillo, who gave illegals uh, driver's licenses. So this is how they did it. And still, California was pretty conservative. But in 1996, they took the unions down to Santa Ana, and they signed up, the communists took them down there, and they signed up every illegal they could and did a whole bunch of vote fraud, and they got rid of V1 Bob Dornan, the old hardcore Republican, and replaced him with Loretta Sanchez. That was the beginning of the flipping of California, and they replicated that model all through Southern California and into Northern California. All completely organized by the communist movement. In my books, I have 22 California congressmen uh, profile, all deeply in bed with the Marxist movement. From Adam Schiff to Mark Takano, down this way up to Nancy Pelosi, who is just as Marxist as AOC, but she's in a position where she can't talk quite as radical. So we are in a communist revolution, folks. It's in the cabinet, it's in the Senate, and it's in the House. And guess what? It's even in the California legislature. Can you believe that? Oh, yes. You know, look at Rob Bonta, your attorney general, I think. His mother was a, a famous Filipino communist. Deep in the KMU, the Kilisan Mayo Uno, the... It was a, a, a Maoist Filipino communist movement. And he was deeply in bed with that. They got him elected. They also got, Karen Bass was part of the same movement. Karen Bass has been to Cuba at least 23 times, folks. She, is a, she was investigated for running, by when Daryl Gates was the police chief, she was investigated for running Cuban weapons to the black communities of East LA. This is Karen, Karen Bass is a complete and utter Marxist. So is most of your city council. So we're in a revolution. So what do we do? Well, there's a few things. The first thing I think we've all got to realize that this is a basically a spiritual battle. Yes. Uh, whether you're an atheist, agnostic, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, whatever, I think we can all understand there's a spiritual dimension to this war that we're in right now. 
This is not your Republican versus Democrat. This is now good versus evil. We've got a few people on our side, and but hardly any good people on their side. And so we've got to understand what we're dealing with. And we've got to understand how to mobilize our base. Now, the Republicans in this state will generally tell you things like, don't talk about the social issues. Keep it about the sales tax. Keep it about the economy, regulations. Because the social issues are way too divisive. So keep it about the fiscal issues. Well, how's that worked out for you, people? You go to South Central LA and you knock on the door, might be some like, young Latino woman, she's got two or three kids. You say, ma'am, we've got this great candidate for Senate, we've got a great candidate for governor, he's going to cut the sales tax, he's going to cut the gas tax. She doesn't have a car. We're going to cut the gas tax, cut the sales tax. She just says, I just want some cops in my neighbourhood to keep the gangs away from my kids. I want my kids to go to school and not be turned into little perverts. I want my kids to leave school and get a job without having to compete with illegal immigrants. It is the social issues that stir people's hearts, is it not? It is faith, family and freedom. You go knock on some uh, veteran's door, he's got American flags all over the place if they're still legal in this state. And you're knocking the door and say, we've got this great candidate for Senate. He's going to really, really uh, set things up. And he's running pretty close to uh, Adam Schiff right now. He's got a real shot. You say, oh, sounds great. Sounds great. Um, he's, but he's, he's going to really work on cutting the taxes. And he's going to really work on, on you know, bringing down the cost of living. He says, look, I just, I'm just worried about my grandson turning up to Thanksgiving wearing a dress. You know, what is it that motivates you? You've got millions of Christians in this state, millions of conservatives have been completely burned off the GOP because the GOP will not touch social issues. And it's the social issues that stir people's hearts, folks. It is only the social issues that stir people's hearts. And most people vote on emotion, folks. They don't really analyse the state budget and do a projection 10 years forward and what this is going to do. They don't even think about that, but they're worried as heck about their schools. They're worried about the crime. They're worried about their kids. They're worried about their culture, their faith and their borders. This is what you've got to talk about. And I'm so glad to be here with the Republican wing of the Republican Party. Because you can talk about what you darn well want and endorse who you darn well want to. We know there would have been no Reagan without you guys. And I'll tell you something too, there would have been no Trump without you people either. Now some of you would know my good friend Malcolm McGough, I'm sure. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Election integrity, but in 2016 he ran the Trump phone banking in the state. Now he's a former Australian army officer, very high ranking, and you need to understand the visceral pain it gives me as a New Zealander to say something nice about an Australian. But you need to understand where I'm coming from. But Malcolm McGough had a hundred thousand phone bankers in 2016, ten thousand in any one evening, and five weeks before the election they were told to train all of those guns, metaphorically speaking, on Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, and told they had to win them from California, and they did. Trump would not have been president without California, people. Because you have so many conservatives here, so many Christians, so many patriots, so many veterans, but because the GOP will not stand up for their issues, they will not come out to vote. Do you think I'm wrong in this analysis, folks? So there's a message 
for the Republican assemblies. It's all about the school boards. It's all about getting the perverts out of the schools. It's about standing up for what people want. Now, election integrity is another thing. And the Republican Party will say, nah, we've got to move on. You know, it's, yeah, there might have been some fraud, but you know, that's old. We've got to move on. Well, here's my argument. It's a civil rights argument. Now, you will go out, probably that same old veteran with the American flag, the American flags, hardcore military guy, loves America like you wouldn't believe. And you'll go and knock on his door and say, we've got this fantastic candidate for school board. She's going to stand up to the unions. She's going to throw them out of the school. She's going to get rid of the curriculum, put a Hillsdale College curriculum in. She is going to make education like it should be so kids learn real stuff and have a future. And you'll say, wow, she sounds great. But tell me, do you still have those voting machines in this county? And you'll say, well, yes, we do. And you'll say, well, I don't trust them. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to vote. I maintain this. 5 to 10% of our base is no longer voting because they do not trust the machines. Am I incorrect in this? It's more than that. Well, I'd, I'd be conservative. I'd say it's probably more like 20%. Yes. Okay, but I'd be very conservative here because I'm a conservative. You know? So, you go to the GOP and say, you're always going on about election deniers, how terrible they are, right? Yes, we're sick of them. Election deniers, move on, move on. Well, we've been finding that about 5 to about 10% of our base are election deniers and they're no longer voting. Can we afford to lose 10% of our base going forward? We are denying confidence in elections to 10% of our base. That is a civil rights issue. That is a disenfranchisement issue. And they can't deny that because they're always complaining about people complaining about the elections. And that is not going to be restored until we get paper ballots and voter IDs and people go to jail for committing vote fraud. Only when that happens will they come back. What is worse, stealing your car, burglaring your house, or stealing your election? What do you think is worse? So why is the election treated like a misdemeanor or not at all? And here's, well, exactly, here's the argue, other argument. You know, all these Republicans, you know, I vote for, no, no, no. Look, the Democrats sold guns to the Mexican cartels, the Fast and Furious scandal. They weaponized the IRS against the Tea Party. Proven. They weaponized the FBI and the Justice Department against a sitting president and committed multiple felonies in the process. But they would never commit vote fraud. Are you kidding me? That's all they do. That is how they work. Their only morality is winning. They are Marxists. To a Marxist, they do not operate on our morality. Anything is true if it serves a revolution. Anything is fair if it serves a revolution. We've got to assume they will cheat. We've got to be grateful to find an election where they don't. I think if we had fair elections all over America, if we went social conservative and had fair elections, I think Republicans would, would win 70% of the elections in this country. Easily. So we've got to get real about election integrity. We've got to keep that burning. We've got to get, and, and this, is, this is how you solve these problems before I go on to why we do this. I'm going to give you a bit of a both barrels tonight. Sorry, I'm fired up. So we got major election integrity problems. We got major foreign infiltration problems. Major. Chinese, Russian, mob, 
globalist, North Korean, Cuban, you name it, they're running our country right now. This country is now being run by Barack Obama and Valerie Jarrett and Susan Rice and Xi Jinping right now. So how do we stop this? We gotta treat it like two problems, treat it like organized crime problems. Now who has ever heard of the purple gang of the 1930s? Sometimes it's called Murder Incorporated. It was a mafia hit squad that went all over America killing people for the mob. And they were killing lots of people. They had a whole bunch of cops on the take and nobody would dare to testify against them because they would kill you. So nobody could stop them. Well, they brought in Thomas Dewey, a Republican prosecutor from New York who later ran for president. And he was given the job of taking down Murder, Inc. And this is how he did it. He personally interviewed 1,200 young men to form a small squad of maybe 50. He got the best, the bravest, and the brightest. Absolute cream of the crop. An untouchables unit. Then they went out and started catching a few low-level murder in guys for burglary or extortion. They'd get one. And then they'd say, sir, we got you for seven years or you can have witness protection if you will testify against your an immunity from prosecution if you testify about those above you and um, he will say Ugh, okay and every now and then one of them would flip and that would give them three or four con convictions a bit further up the chain and they'd do the same to them you get 10 years you get 15 years unless you flip on those above you in two years they had the leadership of Murder Inc. on the electric chair and it was gone. Gone. Yeah. So how do you apply this to vote fraud? You've got to set up a special voter integrity unit like we have in Florida that is federal and it is called in on complaints to operate as against organized crime, treat voter fraud as organized crime in the big cities of this country. You get a complaint, you go and investigate. You catch a few people stuffing ballots, you say you got a year in jail, unless you tell us who did it, then they'll tell you who did it, then you go to them, you say you got five years, unless you tell us who paid you, and you go up the chain. You would only have to put 50 people in jail across the country, and vote fraud would be over. People, you cannot clean up LA from California. You cannot clean up Chicago from Illinois. You cannot clean up Detroit from Michigan. This has to be federal. This has to be RICO lawsuits and going into the big cities and cleaning, treating this as an organized crime problem because that's what it is. Now, how do you do the foreign See, what you've got to do, you've got to set up, the next president has to set up a new intelligence agency. And it's got to be the cream of the cream. Nobody from FBI, nobody from CIA, people from police departments, detectives, people from IRS, special forces, the cream of the cream investigators and tough guys. And this new intelligence agency will be super vetted and super compartmentalized so if one bit gets rotten, it doesn't affect the whole lot. And it's all about cleaning out foreign infiltration. And so what you do, you get it set up, then the president declares a three-month amnesty. Three months to every traitor, every spy, everybody paying off congressmen, everybody stealing technology. You've got three months to leave the country permanently or come forward and spill your guts. Three months to come and register your name and you will have to testify in court and if you are truthful, you'll get immunity from prosecution. Your sin will be between you and God. You have a chance to come clean with the American people. You would see probably half a million Chinese leave the country. I'm not kidding. You would see a whole bunch of Russian mobsters sell their mansions in Miami, go back home. Thousands of Iranian businessmen would leave LA. You would have um, a whole bunch of senators would stand down for family reasons. A whole bunch of big tech guys would stand down. 
you would have the biggest cleansing of America you've ever seen and not a shot would be fired. And those who would not come forward, those who would not take the deal, would have so much evidence that they would be easily convicted and they would go to jail for 30, 40, 50 years. You would clean out the foreign infiltration in a couple of years without firing a shot and only putting probably a few hundred people in jail. And the American public would finally understand how deep the rot is and would support the security measures necessary going forward to make sure this doesn't happen again. So why do we even bother? You know, this sounds all very pie in the sky, but I think we're going to see things in our life that we have never expected to see before. We already are. This next year is going to make or break this nation. We're either going to be on the road up or we're going to be heading towards calamity. I can promise you, don't know which way it's going to go, but it ain't going to be the same. I can assure you of that. I will tell you this, I believe we're going to get major violence on the streets this summer, probably just before the election, and if Trump is elected absolutely in that lame duck period, we're going to see chaos all over the country. They're going to go absolutely mental. So get your medicines, get supplies, get your food stocks, get everything you need to survive a couple of months without power, a couple of months where you can hunker down at home if you have to. You know, know where your friends are, know who's got food, um, know who has got medical skills. Get ready for periods of civil disruption. And I'm not saying this to scare you, I'm saying to get prepared and let's hope it doesn't happen. But I think it will, but the road through that is the road back to a free America. So why do we do what we do? Okay, does anybody believe there may have been a little bit of divine providence in the American, Re American Revolution? Yes. You know, the famous fog that came down on New York Harbor just at the right time to save George Washington's troops. You know, the bullets that went through his hand, and, you know, but never through him. Well, if you go to the book of Revelations, there's a little chapter at the back and it talks about the people who go to hell at the end of time. There's categories and there's the liars and there's the idolaters and there's the thieves. But you know the very first two categories? The cowards and the faithless. The cowards. God hates cowards and the faithless. I thought cowardice was, is cowardice a sin? Darn right it's a sin. Because if you believe what you say you believe in, what are you going to be scared of on this earth? Being a coward tells God you have no faith. Being t you know, we're told not to live in a spirit of fear. You know, there's an eternal God out there. So, faithless and the cowards. So, if God hates the faithless and the cowards, does that tell you maybe he admires the faithful and the courageous? You think that's a fair, logical conclusion? So is there any evidence of that? You look at the story of David versus Goliath. Everybody's running this way. There's this big hulking Philistine. And David's got a bit of string and a rock. And he runs that way. Straight at the giant. And he throws this rock. And I've no doubt that God guided that rock. But David had to throw the darn thing, didn't he? So where did he get the courage to do that? You think he might have had a little bit of faith going on there? Think he might have thought, I'm on God's side here. This rock is going to go where it's supposed to go. And even if he kills me, I've done the right thing. Faith and courage go together. When your, found, when your grandfathers and great-grandfathers were sitting in landing barges off Normandy beaches, ready to charge Nazi machine guns, you think those young boys were talking about baseball and girls? You think there might have been a little bit of praying going on? To summon the courage, they, do you think they were trying to deepen their faith? To summon the courage they needed to do what had to be done? 
Gideon's army, another lesson. You know, this hulking great army and, the, and Gideon, give me 10,000 men, Lord. No. 5,000, no. 3,000, no. 2,000, give me 1,000 men, no. 800, give me 800, no. 300. Now, how much courage did 300 have to have to stand up against that army? Now, where do you think that courage come from? When your founding fathers with their squirrel rifles, these blacksmiths and fishermen and farmers with squirrel rifles, took on the world's greatest military machine. Do you think maybe they thought God was on their side? Or they were on God's side? Do you think maybe that gave them the courage they needed to do what they did? You know, most of your military leaders were pastors, the famous black robe regiments. Bible in one hand, long rifle in the other. Because this is what I say. To get out of this mess, we need help. We've got to tell the truth. We've tried everything else. We've got to tell the truth. We're in a communist revolution, and people have got to know that. Telling the truth takes courage. But courage is proof of faith, and faith pleases God. Do you think we're going to get some help by being sniveling cowards and apathetic losers? Do you think it's really going to inspire God to sort of confound our enemies or, you know, maybe do a miracle here or there? This is our time just like it was your grandfather's time. Just like it was your great-great-grandfather's time. We are free because they had courage and they had faith. No other reason. So I think where we are in America today is analogous to Germany in the 1930s. Because Hitler was on the rise and he wrote his book and he told people what he was going to do. And he was breaking windows and trashing Jewish shops and he was, you know, committing thuggery on the streets. Nobody should have had any illusions what he was about. And there was only one force that could have stopped Hitler who had the numbers and the moral authority to do so, and that was the German church. And what did they do? Nothing. With one or two notable exceptions, like Bonhoeffer and one or two others. They put swastikas in their churches. They became good Nazi Christians. And that led to a war that killed tens of millions of people. And who had to sort the mess out, folks? It was young boys from your country and my country and Britain and Canada and South Africa and Denmark and France who had to put on uniforms and pick up guns and charge Nazi machine guns on open beaches. So we've all heard that famous story in World War II and I don't even know if it's true but I think it illustrates the point. We've heard about a little church on a railway siding in Germany. And they're all singing one Sunday morning and praying and, you know, just singing and hymns or whatever. And a train pulls up outside and it's got a whole bunch of boxcars behind it. And they have banging from the boxcars, help us, help us, help us. Water, water, we are thirsty. There are children in here. Help us, help us. And what did those good German Christians do? They sang louder. So you tell me, who would you rather be on Judgment Day? Tell me, would you rather be that good German Christian who was a good man and honest in business, faithful to his wife, good to his children, paid his taxes, was a good member of the community, went to church every Sunday, prayed every single day, a model citizen, because that's what a lot of people think is all they have to be. A moral citizen. But on the one day, he was asked to prove his faith by showing the courage necessary to love his neighbour as himself. That one day, he was put to the test. And he failed. Would you rather be that 21-year-old boy from Temecula who died face down in a pool of blood on Omaha Beach. Who would you rather be on Judgment Day, folks? Who do you think honoured God more? It is not enough 
just to be a good citizen. It is not enough just to do your little bit and vote and whatever. In times of crisis, we are called on to be courageous, to put our careers at risk if necessary, just like your founding fathers were prepared to risk everything for this country. We are free today because when the time came, your ancestors were willing to pick up guns and put on uniforms and, and fight for years against horrible enemies, overwhelming odds sometimes. And your grandmothers and great grandmas, when your boys were overseas or in battle, they were working all day on the farm or at the hospital or at the shipyard. They were keeping the kids in school and then they were staying up to two o'clock in the morning every night, knitting socks and writing letters to their boyfriends and husbands. We are free today because of their sacrifice. Is it our moral obligation to get out of our darn comfort zones and sweat blood for what we believe in? Is it our moral obligation to be willing to make the sacrifices sufficient to secure the freedom that we had handed to us? Is that our moral obligation? And is it our moral obligation to sweat blood and do whatever it takes and be as brave as we need to be to ensure that this great nation is handed to our children and grandchildren, not just as good as you came to it, but even better? Yes. Is that our moral obligation? And might we be judged on how well we perform that duty at some point? Or certainly be judged by our children. We will either be remembered proudly or we'll be remembered with great embarrassment by our grandchildren and children. You know, I would love that in 100 years time, my great great granddaughter does a history project and she looks up my name or your name or whatever and say, guess what? My great-great-grandma, she was part of the second American Revolution. She helped to save this country when everybody thought it was lost, when everybody thought it was too hard. So I just want to say this, folks. Please get some books. If you're in a war, you've got to know your enemies. One of those books has got all of the communist conference, communist congressman in Southern California, got a book on the senators, book on Biden. And if you want to know where the churches are standing up, you've got to watch enemies within the church. You've got to watch that. But mostly what I want to say is this. I don't know how this is all going to turn out, but I do know this. The 2016 election convinced me that God is not finished with this country yet, folks. It's not finished. But we have to do our bit. And if we sweat blood for our faith, our family, our freedom, if we sweat blood, two things may happen. One, we may give it everything we have and maybe we still lose. But at least all of us will earn the right to look our children in the eye and say, I did everything I possibly could for you. And what is that worth to you folks? And if we win this, and we absolutely can win this, folks. We will set in stage the stage for the biggest economic boom in world history, a liberty revolution that will spread all across the world and set the stage for a much needed spiritual revival and a moral revival in this nation. And we will hand on to our children, not just the great country that most of you are born to and a few of us came to, but one that is even greater, one that may lead the world in freedom and prosperity for hundreds of years into the future. Is just the chance of that worth the sacrifice? So I want to say to all of you, thanks so much for standing up, being part of the Republican Assemblies, the Republican wing of the Republican Party. God bless America. God bless California. God bless your public listening. Thank you.